I welcome you to the very first Tuesday in the month of August, 2022. This is Language Joes, an Academy of Knowledge Economy, and my name is Josephine, your digital professor. Tuesdays like this, I teach modules or courses from philosophy, philosophy of religion, theology, religion, and spiritual formation. On Fridays, I talk on contemporary or trending issues that are critical and very important, at times essential for our well-being, our community, and what we need to know to be better in offices, to be better in our homes, and to be better person generally. Language Joes is set up for an in-depth understanding and teaching of subjects or courses is to help our students or those who are just interested in knowledge to gain an extra knowledge in it. But I am willing to help more by giving a one-to-one -one teaching or group teaching when asked to do so at a cost. This one I do is free. In any of my videos, if you check my description link, you will find my Gmail, my Gmail account. There are two of them. The J.O. Ishoboyejo and the Language Joe's Gmail account is there. It's good for you to reach me through them by sending comments or asking questions. Or we might even make your questions in the comments in the description box as well. But I seek out to impact knowledge. And I want you please to encourage me more with your feedback so I can be better. And also, I want you to tell others about this channel. I want you to share it. I want you to subscribe. I want you to like it. It helps. That's the benefit for this free teaching. Today, I'm continuing on another aspect of what I started before on metaphysics, metaphysical issues in philosophy of religion. I will be looking into atheism, theism more today and some arguments, some scholarly arguments, debates on theism and atheism, which are part of the metaphysics or what we can call metaphysical issues in philosophy of religion. Please join me as I go to language Joes for you to just know what language Joes is all about. I welcome you back. You know, as a teacher, I love to share my PowerPoint presentation. It's very good. It's like showcasing to you some bullet points. You can take your pen, you can take your paper to jot down notes. It's for you not to have any excuse of saying, oh, what? I can't hear Josephine. What did the uh, digital professor just say? So, when you combine hearing with seeing yourself, then you'll be able to know you better. So that, that's the main reason for sharing PowerPoint presentation with you. It's essential for you, so that you can read yourself, you can understand yourself, what I'm trying to do. 
Because in whatever comes or subject, I teach them, I give an in-depth understanding. For those of you who are familiar with this channel, I've taught on environmental philosophy of religion and ecotology. I've taught on philosophy of religion proper. And now I'm going on the metaphysics or some of metaphysical issues in philosophy of religion. So I want you to join me as I share with you my PowerPoint presentation. Theistic arguments and debates. Theistic arguments and debates. Ethics, atheism, those who do not believe in God at all. Agnostics, those who claim God is dead, or those who claim unnatural things, they just don't believe there is any being that is God. Theism is for those who believe in the existence of the supreme being known as God. And three major world religions fall within this theism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. I, let's look at this debate and see what we want to learn from them. There's what we call the classical ontological argument by Saint Asim. Saint Asim, a philosopher, a scholar, who lived between 1033 to 1109. You can imagine, he passed on in 1109 and still his argument is still valid for other philosophers of this generation and will be. He argues that if we understand God as a being, we cannot conceive a greater one. Yet, if we conceive of such a being as existing only in the understanding a greater being could be conceived, namely one that also exists in reality. That is when you think about a being, you are consisting of somebody who is a great being and then you are saying he exists in reality. But this will be contradictory. Hence, God must exist as the being we cannot conceive of a greater. That is, when you are talking about God, this being, then in your mind, in your heart, you must not have any other thinking that there is anything greater than this particular being. So God must assist as the being we cannot conceive of a greater. Our same strategy is to move from the admission that we have the concept of the being that we cannot conceive a greater to the conclusion that God cannot be understood not to exist. I think you are following what I'm saying. Those who already believe that God exists now better understand God's existence. In summary, let me put it in summary, in three key words, what has Sam is saying or what he said in, of, in his philosophical statement. One, that God truly exists. Two, that he cannot be taught not to exist. And three, how the fool said in his heart, what cannot be taught. That's the essence of all his arguments. There is another argument, a version, a, what we call it a contemporary mother version of ontological argument from Alvin Platinga, another philosopher. Alvin Platinga was born in 1932. 
And the first thing he do in his reviews, he reviews some philosophical statements. So he reviews and rejects Gonilo's objections to Assam's ontological argument, because that is what we call philosophy. You come out with your own philosophical statement. Someone else can reject it, can reveal it, either accept it or reject it in totality, coming out with another philosophical statement. So Gonilo uh, had objections to Assam's ontological argument. Gonilo's argument will work only with properties with an intrinsic maximum, but the unsurpassable properties of Gonilo's island have no intrinsic maximum. There could always be a greater. That's what Gonilo is saying. Thinking that an island, okay, it's because you've not been to another person's island. That is why you are thinking there's no greater island than your own island. That's in a nutshell what Gonilo is trying to say. There could always be a greater. He then evaluates several versions of the ontological argument before developing his version. So according to Platinga, it is possible that some being has maximum greatness. However, if a being has this property, it has it in every possible world. So reasons Platinga if God may assist with this property, it is necessary that God assist. However, in the end, Platinga remains skeptical of the ontological argument, for it requires that one accept the premise that a being with maximum greatness is possible. If you don't have that, that there is a being that has this maximum greatness, you cannot even be talking about the assistance of God. There's another argument we call classical cosmological argument by Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas was born in 1224 and died in 1274. Thomas offers a deductive version of the cosmological argument. He states that we witness things in motion. For something to move, it must be moved by something else. That if you see something moving, moving, in metaphysical, either you are seeing that thing, either you see the unseen hand, let me call it the unseen hand, when something is moving, then definitely something is moving it. That which moves things, either is moved by another thing in motion, or is itself or moved. That is, for something to move something, it's either that thing is also being moved in motion. That is why it's able to move that thing. Or that thing is static or moved. Because if that thing is static or moved, then it can easily move that thing. Emotion that which moves either is moved by another thing, emotion, or is itself unmoved. In which case, an unmoved mover exists. The former option invokes an infinite regress of movers, infinite regress of movers, which is impossible. For one thing, it will involve moving an infinite number of things in a finite time. It depends on where you are. You can call it infinite or you call it infinite. Finite or fin finite. So, moving an infinite number of things in a finite time. For another, if one removes the cause, one removes the effect. But an infinite series has no first cause, and thus can have no effect. Finally, if all the causes are instrumental causes, there is no first cause to bring about the effect. Hence, there must be an unmoved mover, 
we should religious believers understand to be God. And that is Thomas Aquinas for you. Using the classic car or what we call the classical cosmological argument. We have another argument from contingency by Bruce Richenbach. Some things claim that God's existence best explains the existence of a contingent universe. Bruce, born in 1943, exploits the need for explanation. Nothing, the defenses of, of fashions of the principles of sufficient reason and concession. Those who are doing philosophy or philosophy of religion, they know and they are taught these principles of sufficient reason and causation. I'm not going into it deeply in this free online teaching. The modern version of the principle of sufficient reason, which is contingent of needs and explanation, is what the cosmological argument must invoke to succeed. After distinguishing scientific from personal explanation in terms of invention, or in terms of intention, sorry, I'm all right, in terms of intention, he notes that taste, tastes have held that a variety of things, including individual contingent things and the universe, require an explanation. If they present a version of the cosmological argument from contingency and defend it against three serious objections. The first is that universe is, the second is that one explains the old by explaining the past. The first is that the universe is a past. The second is that one explain the old by explaining the past. And the third is that the argument's conclusion is contradictory. In the end, Rechenbach suggests that a necessary being, or you can call it God, to whom the principle of sufficient reason is inapplicable, provides the best explanation in the cases he considers. Let's look at another argument. And this time it's from Kalam. Kalam cosmological argument by, and according to Kalam, cosmological argument developed by medieval Arabic philosophers. The universe had a cause for its existence because it had a beginning. And whatever has a beginning must have a cause. And you know, God has no beginning. And that is why even for uh, Christians or those who believe in the biblical records, in Genesis, he said, in the beginning. That means it's like internal. If in a test, it has no, it has no beginning. Because if you want to refer to a beginning, you say from the beginning or the beginning. Not in the beginning, they are just talking about it. So, the universe has a cause because the universe has a sister in the beginning. I mean, as a beginning, from the beginning, you can say oh, this universe is from this beginning. And whatever has a beginning must have a cause. William Lee Craig, born in 1949, presents an, uh, four arguments two from philosophy and two from physics to support the claim that the universe had a beginning. And if the universe had a beginning, somebody or something, a being without a beginning, caused the beginning of the universe. One philosophical argument shows that a natural infinite cannot exist. A natural infinite cannot exist because it leads to the absurdity that the whole is not greater than its parts. 
The other shows that if a natural infinite coexist, one could not traverse it, which would mean that one could not reach it. The dual supporting argument from physics appeal to the Big Bang model of the universe origin to confirm the universe beginning. And that, according to the second law of thermodynamics, if the universe existed infinitely, by now we should have been gobbled up by black holes or suffered a heat death. I repeat that. And that, according to the second law of thermodynamics, if the universe existed infinitely, by now we should have been covered or by black holes or suffered a heat death. Ultimately, Craig concludes that since the universe had a beginning, it was caused. That's the principle of causality. And the cause had to be personal, not natural. Hello? Still pointing to the existence of God. There's another one by William Pelly. We call it analogical theological argument. William Pelly was born in 1743, died in 1805. He knows that one will react differently to finding a wash than a stone. A watch, you need stone. You know, there are different things. On finding a watch, one would note its intricate means and structure. We suggest that it had an intelligent maker. Pelly then notes that human and animal eyes also have means ends. Ordering indicating that nature also had an intelligent creator. That we have not seen watches or eyes made, that sometimes they do not work, that we do not know the functions of all their parts, or even that we can invoke laws governing them, does not mitigate the force of the argument Kelly noted that as we will reject men natural explanations for the watch, so should we reject men natural explanations for organs like eyes? Granted, there are defects in nature. Yeah, we have some defects in some eyes. But these are due to causes of which we are ignorant, not God's lack of knowledge. Let's now look at Robin Collins' argument, anthropic theological argument. Robin Collins was born in 1961. Knows that there are many fine-tuning cosmic conditions, each of which is highly unlikely in and of itself, yet all are necessary to be conscious, knowing beings like ourselves, in order the beauty and elegance of the natural laws and the intelligibility and discoverability of the universe structure. In attempting to account for these features, one may appeal to either a theistic or naturalistic explanation. Collins introduces the likelihood principle of confirmation, according to which observations are more probable under the hypothesis. Collins argued that since fine tuning is much more probable under theism than under naturalistic single universe hypothesis, the principle implies that the evidence from fine tuning supports a theistic rather than a naturalistic account of the origin of the universe. Even on the many universes model, 
which holds that it is likely that a significant number of habitable universes coexist. And that's one of the reasons where human beings have been trying so much to go into the moon, to land on moon, to investigate other planets. The assistance of God provides a more probable explanation. Not only are the many universes models highly speculative, but even if such is possible, what generates the many universes has to be well designed to produce universes capable of abhorring life. Since they've been going to the moon, they've not said that if they can, or they've not discovered any other planet that is abhorring life. Except in only cyber movies that we know this. But in reality, Against theism, again, again, let's look at it again. Theism provides a better explanation of the apparent design found in the beauty and elegance of the resulting universes than atheism does. So the argument from fine tuning, beauty and discoverability is not intended to prove God's existence or even show that God's existence is likely. Instead, it is intended to show that this universe features count as substantial evidence for God's existence, making it considerably more plausible and naturalism. A moral argument. The last of the arguments I'm looking into now is a moral argument for God's existence by C.S. Lewis. Suez Lewis was born in 1898 and died in 1963. He argues that we all know the difference between right and wrong. Yes, we know the difference between right and wrong, except we do not want to be truthful. And accordingly, acknowledge that there is an objective moral law, a law of human nature. We are all called to obey it. Though we are not successful in keeping it, we have unique access to ourselves. And when we look within ourselves, we see that there is a law of human nature and that it indicates that someone, someone or something wants and commands us to behave in a certain way. This somebody or something or being which urges us to do right and make us uncomfortable when we do wrong is best understood as a power who directs the universe. So even if you are not following all the other philosophical discussion or debates on theism or atheism and things like that, the moral argument is solid because once you know there's a wrong and a right and once you know that you can know it and something urges you to do right and make you uncomfortable when you do wrong so it's better understood as a power who directs the universe and that power that directs the universe is no other power than the power of being that none is greater than and that is god I know in this particular teaching, there's a lot of philosophical and scientific, uh, I don't want to use the word jargon, words that are used. That is why philosophy or philosophy of religion is, is I, I always say, is the king of all courses and disciplines because it crosses over science and humanities, arts, whatever discipline you are. Philosophy of religion, it brings it, intertwines it with religion, with theology. So I thank you for joining me for this other course. Join me again on Friday for another Friday tonic. Have a very blessed week. <laughs>